Hello, this is February 5th, 2008. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig. Our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. We're privileged to have with us today Louis J. DeChico. Welcome, Lou. Thank you for coming. Thank you. May I ask you, Lou, when you were born? Uh, November 4th, 1924. And where were you born? Boston, Massachusetts. And your current address? In Framingham, Mass. And how long have you lived in Framingham? Mm, since 56. And where did you grow up? Natick. You grew up in Natick. Yes, I did. What was Natick like back then versus it was, today? It was the greatest little town you ever wanted to see. What do you remember uh, about it? Everyone knew everybody. And uh, we all hung out together. And no, no matter what part of Natick, you knew different people from each part. It was Squash End where I lived. And what was Squash End? It was up near the Coolidge Junior High School. And we, you know, there was Felchville and all kinds of different nicknames. Skunk Hollow and And where the was Navy Skunk Yard. Hollow? The Navy Yard, I know, is Washington Ave. Right. Skunk Hollow was down around, uh, oh, what is the name of the street now? Cemetery Street, okay. down that area. Yeah. And there was uh, Felchville, of course. Felchville where, being uh, in North, North Natick. Natick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forgot some of the others, but uh, it's... And you went through Natick schools? Yes, I did. I started the Oak Grove School, which is now, I think, the Johnson School is Johnson School on... Is that the one on uh, Cottage, uh, not South Main Street? Yes. That was the Oak Grove School in those days. And you went to Natick High School? I went to Coolidge Junior High and then to Natick High. And Natick High was in the downtown district at that yes, time? Yes, it was. It was It was an older building, but a nice building. And tell us about getting your diploma. Well, I never did actually get it personally. They mailed it to the house. And what happened was I joined the service in February of uh, 43. And in those days, if you were up in your grades, uh, being a senior, you could uh, get in, go into the service and still get your diploma. So you went early prior yes. to graduation, oh, and yes. they allowed you to do that because yeah, of your good I grades? I wasn't the only one. A lot of your classmates did the same? Well, there was one other that went with me, uh, uh, William Billy Florio from my area. He lived on Madison Ave. And you both went together as buddies? Yeah, we went in. Uh, there was another one, too, Robert Young from North Natick. He didn't live there then, but he does now. And why did you join at that time? Well, things were a little different back then. The Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, which nobody knew was there. And uh, it, uh, it was the thing to do, really. You know, everyone was very patriotic in those days. And uh, it, everyone I know, sooner or later, went into this, uh, tried to get in. Some, of course, failed. But most of them got in. and. Uh, the ones that didn't were really upset about it. They tried every, every avenue they could think of, but some of them just couldn't make it on kind of difficulties, you know, physical difficulties or something. What branch did you join and why? I joined the U.S. Navy for the simple reason that I thought I would be stationed near Boston, close to home, of course, and it uh, didn't work out that way. And where did you get stationed? Well, I did the basic training at Newport, Rhode Island. And then they did, I did fire control school at Newport, Rhode Island. And how long was your basic training? I think it was six weeks. I'm not positive. What do you remember about it? That it was altogether different than the life I had been living uh, there was a mess of guy, fellows there. We lived in a Quonset hut. And uh, 
everything, we were told to do everything. We couldn't do anything on our own. And that was a little different from your life it in It sure Manic. was. Yeah. What do, you, um, dis what do you think you disliked about it? I, I don't, I was so young, I was only 18, so I don't think I, I knew any better to dislike anything in those days. And you mentioned from basic you went into, was it a, an advanced or specialized training? It was you, a specialized training to be a fire controlman. And what, what does that mean, fire control? It's the, it's the, let's see, how can I put this? It's the aiming of the guns on the ship through what they would call today a computer so that you can lead the, the planes and et cetera, you know? So it, was, it had to do with armament rather than fire itself. Fire meant shooting of the guns. And yours was aiming, making sure you had the right coordinates and things of that Yeah, nature. what happened is on the ship, on the five-inch guns that shoot for airplanes and, and other type of firing, uh, you, you can't just shoot the guns. They, they go through, there's a, well, let me put it this way. There's a, a place up on the top of the ship, up fairly high, that uh, is like a little hut. And in that hut is scopes, one, one for training, which is going laterally, one for vertical, and one for... Uh, the faster you go with, with this mechanism up there on the plane, it, it will send a signal down about three, three decks below the ship uh, to what they call plot, which was like a computer center. And what, what happened there is it would put a, send a signal to the guns themselves how far to, to go ahead of the, the plane, how far to go up above the plane, how fast it was going. So these were the large guns on the ship? Not the large ones. They were the anti-aircraft guns. The okay. large ones were 14 inch. They were huge. Okay. Uh, when they fired, the ship bounced back about three feet. So these were the smaller... These were the smaller... There was, there was the, main, the main battery was the, the, the large 14 inch guns aboard our ship. The air, air, the aircraft guns were the five inch, forty millimeters, and twenty millimeter guns. Well, the forty millimeters and twenty millimeters were done with a sight right on the uh, the, the equipment, the, the gun. On the five inch, they were done through a computer, like I explained. It mm -hmm. was the, you had to. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were sent. I was sent to up. learn how to use. What to do and, and you know how to how to manipulate it and and what you had to do to do to get the difference in, in, from the for the speed of the the airplane or, or whatever you're doing and we also did once we got to an island and, and bombarded the island uh, the marines would call the ship and ask for fire at night uh, what they call the star shell so they could see the enemy, and they, w they would call us directly, and we would get the coordinates and send up a... Uh, uh, a star shell might light up the sky yes, a bit? Yes, it does, mm -hmm. yeah. Like a f big flare, huge. And they would give you the coordinates, yeah, and, and you would plan yeah. that. So you did the advanced fire training both in Newport and you mentioned San Diego. San Diego. How long were you in San Diego? Oh, about eight weeks. And then from there, what happened? They, I was sent to board the ship, the U.S. Pennsylvania, in Pearl Harbor. And we went by, I'm not sure whether it was a what type of merch marine ship it was we went over on, and uh, we went right aboard the ship once we got there. Tell us a little about the USS Pennsylvania. It was a grand old ship. It was the, it was the, uh, the what, let's see, 
the Missouri of World War II, was, who was uh, the, star, the fleet, the, the queen of the fleet in World War II was uh, the Missouri. The Pennsylvania was that during World War I. It was an, one of the older ships. And we ran with all the older ships that were at Pearl Harbor when the uh, Japanese bombed them. And was the Pennsylvania bombed at Pearl Harbor? It sure was. So in 1941, One, yeah. it was bombed. And then was it refurbished? It sure was. It was refurbished. And it, uh, before I got on it, it had made a trip to uh, the Aleutian Islands which was at two and up in the, the North, North Atlantic. Was, and uh, then it came back to Pearl Harbor when, and then I got on it there. You got on. Now, going to Pearl Harbor, no. having grown up in, as you noted, a small town in Massachusetts, had you done any kind of traveling before? No, never. You know, we, I, I shouldn't say never. My mother and father did what they could. We took a trip maybe to Fall River or to Boston, but uh, Fall River was a long trip. New York, I don't ever remember going to New York. Uh, after the war I did, but not before the war. So what uh, was it like, first of all, for you to be going out to the West Coast, out to San Diego, and then to Hawaii? It, it, it happened so darn fast mm -hmm. that, uh, and you're so young, you don't realize the things you should have saw. There were so many things that I should have really paid attention to that I didn't. But it was it was a marvelous experience. Uh, it was so different to see palm trees because it was around the Christmas time, and uh, no Christmas trees, palm trees, and. I, I, I just didn't, I didn't like California because they, they didn't seem to have the change in seasons. Or, uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't home. Not that it wasn't beautiful, but it wasn't home. So that was different. And what about at Hawaii? Did you get an opportunity or once you arrived at Pearl Harbor, were you immediately sent to your ship? I was immediately sent to the ship. Once I got on the ship, we could get off, and we, we went to, uh, you know, different places. So being on the USS Pennsylvania, what was your um, charge? What, what was the charge what? of the ship itself? I, I don't understand what, what you mean. You charge. were out at sea. When we went out to sea? Mm -hmm. yeah, what was my duties? Well, what was the duty of the ship itself? Oh, the ship was, was to supply... Uh, firepower for the, the landing of the Marines on different islands. And we started off, I, when I got on the ship, we started off at the Gilbert Islands and we went to the Mariana Islands and we went to the Philippines and every island out there that was bombarded, the USS Pennsylvania was there. So you were actually in combat? Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Tell us about that. Tell us about a, 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 a typical day. A, a, a typical day at sea is a lot different than a typical day at, when you're f at the island. Uh, at sea, you just had things. It was, they had entertainment aboard ship. They had a band. And when we could, they got up on deck and we had what they called smokers. There was uh, boxing matches and with different guys. And uh, they had the band, which was playing all the old songs that we remembered with, with Glenn Miller and the Dorsey brothers, etc. And it was really, it was nice. It was, but the ship was so big that you never knew everybody. There was... I think about 2,300 fellows aboard ship, one of them who happened to be Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson of TV fame? Of TV fame. Do you remember him? 
I didn't even know who he was at the time, and not until later in life did I realize who he was. But I have pictures of him at home, you know, in the book that I have. Yeah. So there are over 2,300 on the ship. Yeah. So my sense is that you had different watches. Yeah, you had a watch every year. Uh, you had an eight-hour watch. You'd be on for, for eight, not for 16. Uh, the, and what happened is sometimes they would uh, send a plane over and he would be pulling a, a, like a target and we would have anti-aircraft practice of the, with the guns and would shoot in the air at the, uh, the sleeve that was going by. And uh, we were always doing something really. And once we got to an island, then we were on all the time, we were on continually. And when you were at one of these islands, and apparently there were numerous islands, as oh, you yes. mentioned. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. How long did... We stay at the island? Yeah. We stayed at the island depending on how, how fast the Marines or the Army would infiltrate the, the coast and everything. So that, because the guns would only fire so long, so far. And... Uh, I would say that on an average of maybe a week, maybe longer on some of the islands. Do any of these, would you call them forays or what, any of these incidences, does one in particular stand out in your mind as being more difficult than some of the others? Well, we were at Tower one, and actually the, the sea at Tower got almost red from blood from both um, Japanese and Americans. And what happened was that they had, we had poles that, that had a hook on the end of them that if a body was going by, if it was an American would pull them, if it was Japanese would just let them go. And it was, and then we had a ceremony, you know, and buried them at sea with the proper was that yeah. difficult for you as an 18-year-old? Not really, because you didn't, I didn't see them die, actually. We were just pulling them in. The, uh, it, it wasn't a, a, a really nice experience, don't get me wrong, but as far as uh, being gruesome, it, I, I don't think it was that. It was just, it was a, it was a shame that they had to be there either. Most of the, of course, in my time, it was the Americans that I was worried about. I didn't care what, about what, that. What were you hearing about the war and the Japanese at that point in time? Oh, well, Tokyo Rose. We, used to, we had the radios aboard ship, of course. And every once in a while, Tokyo Rose would say, the U.S. Pennsylvania has been sunk. And the news would get home to your parents, and they would write, and they'd be scared. And... and uh, you know, we tried to, that's why we tried to correspond with the, yeah, of course, everything was censored in those days, too. But you would try to let oh, oh, your yeah. family We'd, know that... And you, if, if you didn't, the chaplain would get a notice and, and they'd come down and say, listen, Lou, write home, would you please, because they're, they're worried about you. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was handled pretty good, really. So between the time, my sense is... 1943, after basic and some specialized training, you were out on the USS Pennsylvania. About 1944, I started. 1944. Yeah. And how long were you on the ship? How long did I live on the ship? Yeah. Till the end of the war. So I mean, I, I, the years. only the only time we it was twice we got off. Once we we took a. a a trip to Australia, because we had been out for so long, they wanted to give us a week. So we what you out, would call R and R yeah, week for of a week okay at, at, at Australia, and we pulled into what a beautiful harbor, Sydney Harbor in Australia was, and it was so great to see people other than sailors. Uh, of course, the first thing you do when you get on a on any any place that has, uh, you know, food and fresh food and things, 
First thing you do is get eggs, sunny side. Second thing you do is get fresh milk. And you just don't get enough the first day. After that, come what may. So you remember that vividly? Oh, that was, that was the best thing in the world, to get some fresh eggs and uh, fresh milk. And during your time on the ship, uh, my assumption is that the climate was a lot different than New England. Climate. Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It was warm all the time. One time we went through a tornado, which uh, was very, very, very rough. It was probably the worst I had ever seen the, the ocean. And I had seen the ocean quite often because we uh, used to go to the ocean once in a while. So uh, it was terrible with the typhoon, especially with the sh on the ship because what happened is, is the smaller ships, the destroyers, went into a wave, they would go up and, and then the, the, the uh, rear end of the ship would go up and the propellers would be out of, out of water and they'd just whine and uh, then they'd come back down and get in and some of them uh, tipped over, you know, actually uh, uh, a couple of them sunk because they couldn't uh, take Did you it. ever fear for your life during a tornado like this? Not really, because you, you didn't realize it was what was, you were a little scared, but not that you were gonna die. Uh, the only, there's only once I think, that I, I, I felt uh, uh, a little scared, maybe twice. Was that because of a storm or because no, of the because, battle that was yeah, happening? Yeah, because of the, kind of the battles, yeah. Yeah, once, uh, what happens is that once one of your ships get hit, like a destroyer got hit and it was going to sink, they had to get rid of their torpedoes and they had maybe four or five, whatever they had left, they would actually just let them go. And one time they let them go right at us. So this was, this was friendly fire. <laughs> fire, <laughs> yeah. Coming right yeah, they, at you. Oh yeah. And at that, in those days, that time of, of uh, my life, I was in plot, which is down about uh, four or five decks below sea level. And, uh, and all around you is uh, ammunition and oil and gasoline, so that if the damn thing ever had hit the ship, we would have blown sky high. And talk a little bit about what it was like being four levels down below, four... Well, it's, it's just like being here. But it wasn't claustrophobic at all? Oh, no, not to no. me. I'm no. not claustrophobic at all. In fact, I tried to get in the submarine service, but I, I had had a mastoid operation years ago, and uh, they wouldn't take me. Of course, I had a heart murmur too, but they took they me... Took from, they took you in spite anyway. of that. Now, what about being on or below deck and firings going on. What was the noise like for you? Oh, it was you? terrible. Yeah, you didn't hear that, but what happened is you, you, you had earphones on so that you actually didn't hear too much, only what was coming over the phones. And uh, when I was in the director up, up above and we were firing, they were firing the guns, of course, at airplanes, what would happen, the sky would be full of little, big, big blotches of black. And it was the shells exploding. And there were so many up there, that's all you could see. You couldn't see the planes anymore. How they ever got through all of that, I'll never know. But we only, we only shot down about 20 or so planes. Now you say only, is that a low amount? It isn't for, for it is for, for the amount of, Planes that came over, it's a, it's a low amount. Did you ever have any... These were, these were the kamikazes. That's that what I was going to ask you. Did yeah. you have any close calls with kamikazes? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. What happened with the kamikazes, you got to realize that the ship wasn't alone. There was probably 40 other ships there with us. So that when the kamikazes come over, they'd go for, the, of course, the bigger ships like ours. Now explain, in case someone watching this tape has no idea what a kamikaze pilot is. Well, 
It's usually it's an airplane that has enough gas to go one way. The pilot knows he isn't going to go back, and so he tries to hit any object he can hit. And what happens most of the time, at least in our ship, we would send up enough so that they couldn't get to our ship so that they would veer and hit some other ship. So they were basically suicide pilots. They were suicide pilots. That's mm -hmm. what they, uh, you know, uh, we think they're crazy, but you know, this is their, their belief. And uh, they're doing it today, something fierce. Just and, and, uh, with carrying bombs on their bodies and everything mm -hmm. today. That's, so this was? It was that uh, in an airplane. In an airplane. Yeah. And it, did you see any of that happen? Oh, yeah. I was up in the director, and we were shooting, you know, and uh, you could see the plane coming at you, and then all of a sudden you'd hit the plane, and he would just dive off and hit one of the other ships if he could. A lot, a lot of times they went right into the water. They didn't hit anything. But we had, uh, especially when we went in the Philippines, this is when most of it happened at Lady Gulf and uh, uh, Lady, L-A-Y-T-E, Lady Gulf. And uh, then we had the uh, Battle of uh, the Cerro Garo Straits, which where the Japanese came with their uh, ships, and our ships met them, and they, what, they, what they did is they they made a mistake and crossed the T. I don't know if you know what that means. No. But you know how you make a T? The thing is that if the line going up and down on the T is what you want to be, you don't want to be the, the top of the T, because that way, when you're going along, you've got the whole broadside to hit the ship. If you're the up and down, all you've got is the, the, you know, the, the width of the ship. So it isn't the whole length of the ship you can hit. So it's a it's a no no to cross the T. So the Saragara Straits the, in the Philippines. In the yeah. Philippines, you were USS Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania was, was part a, of that. Oh, sure. How long did that particular battle last? Oh, it didn't last that long. I, I would say from start to finish, maybe four hours, the most. But it was constant. Oh yeah, yeah, it, it was mm -hmm. constant. There was, they were going and we were shooting and they were trying to shoot us. And now when you're up in this perch, as yeah, you mentioned, did you they, ever fee yeah, feel they, completely exposed yourself? No, no, because it, it, it was made, it, you, you didn't think you were going to get hit truthfully. We never did. The only time we got actually hit was about two days before the war ended. Talk about that. Where did that happen? It happened at Okinawa. What happened was, after the Philippines, we had fired so many shells, which fired more shells than any ship in the fleet, so that the rifling in the barrels had all worn down. So when they shot, it's supposed to spiral out the, the shell. Mm -hmm. This just went lobbed over and over and over, like, uh, and but so many ships had got hit with the kamikazes that they had to leave us out there as a show of strength. So finally, when they got back to normal, they sent us back to get the guns refitted and everything else, and we got the, all the new equipment. And we had regular computers and not uh, the old servo motors that they had before, and different types of sights and things. So they sent us back out and we went to Okinawa. Okinawa was already taken then. The only two, two battles we missed was Iwo Jima and Okinawa, because we were back getting refitted. So we got to Okinawa, and the Admiral had come aboard the ship, and there must have been a thousand ships in Buckner Bay and Okinawa. And this was, I think it was August, 12th, I think it was two days before, a day or two before the war ended. One lone Jap Japanese torpedo plane come over Okinawa, dropped one f torpedo, and hit us directly in the rear of the ship. And uh, we almost sunk. The first thing that happened was the Admiral got off, which was normal. And uh, 
then it was, uh, they, they put some, some pumps aboard the ship, extra pumps, and they, uh, they kept us afloat, and they, they finally went down and, and put a big uh, plate, welded a big plate on where the hole was, and put a hole in the, about 20 feet in circumference. Where were you at that time? I was just going to bed. And we done, it was four bunks in, in a, up, up and down. Yeah, and I was in the second one. And it knocked me out of the, <laughs> knocked me out of the thing. Uh, of course, I didn't get hurt, but it, it did knock me out, out of it. And then we went to General Quarters, of course, and we were on there. When the peace was declared, we were in General Quarters up on we're looking out for more Japanese planes, but there was none. And they told us, they told us with two seagoing sea tugs from Okinawa to Guam, and uh, because we had no way of propelling ourselves, it knocked out the propellers and everything else. Were there casualties? Oh, yeah. How yeah. many? I think there was 20 died. But Did we, you know any of them? Oh, I knew three or four of them, yeah. Was that difficult, especially being at the end of the war? We didn't realize the end of the war had come, truthfully. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was tough losing your, your, a couple of buddies, you know. It's always tough. To, uh, uh, and were they buried at sea also? Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, the only thing to, even today is I can't stand taps. I hate it when they play taps and shoot the gun. Because it's so emotional it, it, for yeah, you? It, it brings back too many of the mm -hmm. guys that we... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, other than that, it was, uh, wasn't too bad. Once we got to Guam, my, they put us on a dry dock and they fixed the ship up the best they could. And, they put, and luckily, my uncle was stationed in Guam and I got off the ship and I, I was able to spend about four hours with him. And was he in the service at he that time? He was a CB on the on Guam. Yeah. yeah. How did you mentioned that you really didn't know that the war was ending? How did you get your news about what was happening? Oh, in it the was war? after that. The uh, probably uh, the same day, but later in in the day, you know. But yeah. but how did you get your news prior to that time? Did you get? Oh, we had we had radio. Radio. Yeah, because uh, you know. The radio, you didn't set the radio to the office or the day set the radio to the And if there's something important come up other than, you know, uh, he would put it on the loudspeaker so that everyone would hear it. And that was one of the things they put on, you know, uh, that the war had ended and look out for the white plane because it was the peace plane and all of this. But uh, we were still at general quarters, so it didn't make no difference to us. We were and almost talk done. about what general quarters actually entailed. What did that mean? That means everyone goes to their battle station. Everyone is on alert. Everyone has got to go from, from where they are to their battle station, because everyone had a, a specific thing to do during a crisis when we might have to fire the guns, and et, et cetera, you know, so that uh, everyone a board ship went. Uh, this, uh, do you mind if I tell a funny story? I would love to hear a funny story. This is a good story. Every once in a while, you you would have to replenish the food aboard ship. So they would send another ship out there, and they would have cases of different types of food that they would we would bring on the ship. And when that happened, everyone had to come and help bring the stuff on because they didn't want the ship to be there too long in case the enemy came. So the cooks and bakers got together with us and they said, listen, we will give you four loaves of fresh bread if you give us a case of peaches. So we decided, sure, we'll do that. So we, about five of us got together and said, now when the peaches, one of the guys said, the cook said, I know the, the code number for the cases of peaches that are coming on. So we said, fine. So we all got together and they said, now, we'll all get in line. And instead of going this way, you bring your stuff to the, our locker. So the, the cases of 
what we figured were peaches came. So we bought the key. One went this way, and then one went to our lock, and one went to one went to our lock. So we had four cases of peaches, which we thought. So we go to the cooks and bakers. They give us the four loaves of fresh bread. We give them a case of peaches. Well, we opened them up. Each case was sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> well, we almost got killed by the cooks and bakers. <laughs> It didn't uh, quite work the way didn't, they had it. It didn't work out right, no. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was. Uh, but they, you know, a board ship wasn't that. But they had ice cream, which we called Gee Dunks. Why did you call it that? Uh, it, it just, just the name. Just the name Gee Dunk, because the cigarettes were. Uh, you could get a carton for almost nothing. And could you smoke in oh, yeah, most all, areas of the ship? All, all except when general quarters came on. Right. Once general quarters, what happened is they would say the smoking lamp is out, and then you couldn't smoke. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you could smoke all. But you could smoke in your bunk also? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So. so you were towed to Guam. How long did it take you to go from Okinawa to Guam? I would say about... Uh, do you mind if I look? No, go right ahead. You have an information sheet with you, yeah, correct? Yeah, of mm -hmm. some of the things. Mm -hmm. So that information sheet that you're looking at gives a, almost a day-to-day -day description Yeah, it's of a summary of the war service of the USS Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, it, uh, and you mentioned being in dry dock too yeah. while you're looking. How how long was it in dry dock approximately to get fixed? I'll get there. Well, I don't think it says. Okay. While it was in dry dock, right. what did you do? You had... Well, I, I, I was lucky. I got to see my uncle. Okay. Then we went in dry dock too, too long. Uh, and your uncle was in Guam. Did he see a lot of combat while in Guam? I, I don't think so. I, I'm not positive now because I think the island had been taken when he, they got there. We were there and bombarded before, way before that, you know, almost a year before that. And you mentioned Leyte Gulf. Yeah. That was a difficult Whoa. combat also. That, that's where the kamikazes first started, more or less, in, in force. And they, when I say in force, they would come over, oh, maybe 30 or 40 at a time. And do you, what were your first impressions? You had obviously heard about them, but having seen them, actually seen them in action, yeah. what do you remember about that? You know, you thought they were so different than our way of living or thinking that it was, uh, it was strange. We, we actually thought they were a little on the cuckoos, you know, fanatics. But uh, when you stop to think of it, that's the way that the emperor brought them up and everything else, and you know, they're part of life. And, uh, but ha seeing the first batch of planes coming. Well, you were, you were, you were uh, how, how can I explain it? You were scared, but you knew that you had things you could do to overcome it. And luckily, we never got hit by one. And when you mentioned things to overcome, you all had a job to we do. We all had that job mm -hmm. to do. And most of us, we, we did it well aboard our ship. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we got the Navy accommodation, so. Do you feel that your ship and ships, you were in, in a group? Yeah. You mentioned at one point yeah, sometimes. Yeah, we, we traveled in, a, in a, like a pack. A pack. And how many were in the pack? It, it, I, well, there were, there were, let me stop and think. There was probably 40 ships. 
And do you feel that they were equal to or better than or inferior to the enemies? Oh, we were, everything we had was better. You know that. We won the war, didn't we? That's and it wasn't all on the kind of the atom bomb. And you, you heard about the atom bomb. Yes. And what was the sense of the majority of you on the ship? Most everyone thought it was, would benefit both, both countries. You know, they, they thought it was a terrible thing, and we, everyone wishes there was no such thing as an atomic bomb. But if you had to do it, you're saving lives on both Japanese and American. So all lives, as you mentioned, yeah. both, both yeah, American, both, Japanese, both. and... Both. So once you heard the war was over, and you were at that point in Guam, we were on our way to Guam. On your way to Guam. And, and then once you got there, at once the ship was fixed, did you come back? What happened, they put a lot of Marines on the ship that had been out there for a long while, and we came back. And then they had a point system where you could get released and come home. And uh, I was fortunate. I got home early, and instead of uh, coming home by a train or something, they put me on a commercial airplane and uh, came home that way. And what month was that? Was that in 45 at this point? Yeah, well, no, I, it could have been 46, the beginning of 46. So it was late, it was winter time here. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. At what rank at that point were you? Fire controlman, third class. What were your feelings about coming home? Oh, I couldn't wait. I wanted, I wanted to be a civilian. And when you were coming home, once you got home, at that point you were still single. Did oh, you, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And did you discuss with family or friends anything about what you had been through? No, we don't. Uh, none of us talk about it too much, really. Now we're starting to get into it more than, than I ever did, really. In fact, I got grandchildren now that have it in school and that they keep coming and asking me Asking you, you questions. Things. Yeah, and it's about the only time I talk about it, truthfully. It's past. There was that sense from so many of your generation that it, it happened and then you moved on with well, your yeah, lives. Is yeah, that the way you also the way it felt? Is. And when you came home, what did you do for work? Did you go to work? Did you go to school? Oh, I, I started, I went to work first as an elevator mechanic, not a mechanic, but in the elevator business. And uh, the, I started school at night at Northeastern, but then I, at work, I got transferred to a job up in, where was it? Uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, and I couldn't get home at night, so I only lasted in school for about half a term. Did you use the GI Bill for that schooling? Yes, I did, yeah. Um, did you use it for any other reasons, hospitalizations or insurance or anything like that? No, just buy a house afterward later, buy a house later. So with the GI Bill, was it that you didn't need a down payment on a house, or they gave you a... a low, not only that, but it was a low interest rate, too. I think Did, it was 4.5% in those days. That's pretty low. Yeah. Did you join any... Yeah, Did, but you've got to remember that during this, when I was in the service, it was only $27 a month. Sure. That's what your pay was? Yeah. But then you got 50% you got pay for being overseas. 50% more, you yeah, mean? Yeah, So along with the 27, you got? You get 50% more than 27. It was big money. <laughs> Imagine what it does today. Uh, did you join any military reserve or any units like that after the war? Not, not military, no. The only thing I did join in it was forced on me, was the American Legion. 
And why do you say it was forced on you? Well, as I, uh, when I was in high school, I told you we had a great basketball team. Well, when the guys got out, there was all the towns in Middlesex County had a league for basketball. And you played basketball. And, and of course, we all got together and we decided what we might as well. But E.P. Clark Post, which was the post in Natick, already had this. And we said, well, we'll they, we started another was a memorial post. You know, there was two American Legion posts in Natick at one time. And the one you started was because of your basketball group? Yeah. How so long did that last? About three years. And then did you stay with the no, Clark group? No, we, didn't, we, we had nothing to do with the Clark. None of us. Only, one, only the, one, the one person, that one of the fellows I was telling you about, Billy Florio, he was captain of the basketball team. And I was one of the starters, and we left before they went to the tech tournament. And they, hadn't, they didn't talk to us for about four years because they lost the first game there. <laughs> and we were supposed to, we supposed supposed to, be to walk the... over them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, dear. But those were the days. Do you attend any reunions from Oh, yes, your own the group? ship. You do? Yeah, oh, oh, they stopped them now because there wasn't enough left of us, believe me or not. Really? Believe it or not, yeah. What happened is the, uh, they used to have one about every three or four years. Mm -hmm. The last one I went to was in Memphis, Tennessee. And the one before that was Moline, Illinois, and then Memphis again. And uh, that's about the only three I attended to. But each, each time we had it, there were less and less people. And I still talk to one of the fellows of the board ship, lives in Minnesota, and uh, he was telling me that uh, they had to stop them because there was enough people to go. But we used to have two, one in the East Coast and one in the West Coast because the ship was so big, you know. But that was about it. How important do you think serving in the Navy was to you, and how do you feel it affected your life? Uh, I think it, it helped, of course, and it, it made me travel a lot more than I ever would have traveled in my life. It also made me that I don't ever want to go on a cruise you won't go on a cruise? No, I won't go on a cruise. Uh, what about it, with regards to discipline or...? Oh, it, it, it's no question that it was, it was beneficial in, in a lot of ways. And, and you learnt a lot from the people that were on the ship because they were in different parts of the country. And, uh, you know, the southerners and the mm -hmm. hillbillies. And it's amazing that the people that had never seen the ocean that were on the, the on the battleship. They were more surprised than anyone. And did you all fit in together? Well, every once in a while you'd have a, 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 a you know, a fracas with somebody. But... It's like everything else, you know, you, you, your nerves can only take so much, and every once in a while you, you have a little letdown. And, and would it be over anything? Or any was little it? thing that mm -hmm. happened, you know. He, you could be eating, the guy went like this, and he hadn't showered for a few, because that was a, a tough thing, was to shower aboard that, an old ship like that. There wasn't enough water to have showers every day what happened is that if you were on working at the time when the fresh water was on, you had to take a salt water shower, which is terrible. You use that laundry soap they used to use instead of, you know, regular soap. But, but it, it, you know, it all worked out to the best, and it didn't hurt anybody. It, uh, yeah. 
it made you less self-conscious, I think. I think you, you, know, you could do things and not think about them. Did, you, did it help you with your own self-esteem? To a point, yeah, yeah, uh, it does help. Uh, although, you know, really it, you go out of it too. It's, it's something you don't really talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned only going to Northeastern for? About, yeah, about three months, I guess, three to six months. What what was your employment for most of your working I career? I was in the elevator business. For most of your career? Mm -hmm. all, all of my career. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, uh, when I was going to high school, I took every, every course I was going to be a doctor. But that ended awful fast when I got in the Navy. Is, that, is there any regret that you didn't pursue that? Or? No, not really. You know, I mean... I've, I've had a decent life. Do you remember, I know you gave one funny experience about the peaches, yeah. um, or lack thereof. Yeah. Any other memorable experiences, or characters, or individuals that really stand out in your mind? Not really. Uh, everything When you're aboard a big ship like that, you, you develop things with people around you because every, everything is, like the fire control men were all in one division. The uh, bosun's mates were all, the gunnery was all in one division. So you had your own groups. Yeah, we had our own groups. And uh, we all had nicknames and, you know, uh, are you at liberty to say what your nickname was? Dish, mostly. Dish. Yeah, from the Chico. They okay. They said dish. Yeah. So that was it. And uh, what happened, too, was the, uh, well, they call me that here, too, in Natick. Uh, but you would, you would go and you'd have a gee dunk with them, your buddies and all of the stuff. Gee dunk meaning ice cream. Ice cream, yeah. I got a new word today. Yeah, yeah. Did you maintain friendships with many of these individuals? Yeah, but uh, some of them I, I would only see at a reunion. This Ray Braun, who, who was friendly from Minnesota, I talked to him about once a month on the phone. That's wonderful. Yeah. And is it B-R-A-U-N, Ray Braun? B-R-A-U-N, yeah, Raymond Braun. Is there any thought or comment that you would like to share with us as we wind down this interview? Just what I told you at the beginning. You can tell me again. Okay. That I don't think the war serves any purpose except killing the younger people. I think it could all be done if, if people used their head and didn't go to... It's an awful thing. It's an awful thing. All it does is kill the younger folks. Look what's happening today, it's awful. There's no need of all these young people dying. How would you do it I don't do know how you could do it, but there's gotta be, if we can send someone to the moon, we must be able to be able to talk to people somehow. Sit around a table. Yeah, definitely. There's got to be, I mean, there are fanatics everywhere, but there must be a way to get to them. There has to be, other than killing and the young kids. Well, Louis J. DeChico, we want to thank you for telling us your story today, and we appreciate your coming in and sharing that with thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks.